Good day, fellow investors. I recently came across an amazing article from Professors Gabay and Cohen from Harvard and Chicago Booth School of Business, and they came up with a new framework for the market called the inelastic market hypothesis. So not the efficient, but the inelastic market hypothesis that explains a lot of what's going on in the current markets. And there are key theses, and this is really mind-blowing, is that one dollar of inflows into the market increases the value of the market of five dollars. Efficient market hypothesis should have no impact, but they find theoretically and empirically that one dollar increases the value of the market of five dollars. This is really mind-blowing and really important and one of the reasons why I think these guys might be the next Nobel Prize winners as Eugene Fama was for the efficient market theory. But leave academics aside, let's discuss what this matters for you and it will give you an amazing perspective on what's going on and how to invest in the stock market. Their target, their aim is to explain this. Why are markets so volatile? And they actually did it with their framework. So if we just look over the last five days, the market went up 7.37%. For those watching this later, the date of filming, it's November 7, 2020. It's election week in the United States. So this is the result over the week for the market, up 7% in just a week. But let's explain market volatility. <laughs> Last week, when I did another video on the markets, this was the five-day change. So the market went down 4%, this week up, up and down. So what explains the huge volatility? And then plus also this hypothesis will help you understand why the market crashes are so abrupt, so fast, and why are these, again, volatile situations so common, but also specifically so abrupt? And what drives these situations? You will see it is you who does that. It is households and their panicking who create market crashes, who drive the market mostly, and that also explained with the inelastic market hypothesis. That's what they did, an amazing article. And to finish, I'm going to explain at the end of the video how, thanks to what, how the market looks like and what are the basics of the inelastic market, it's most likely that the S&P 500, and you can call me crazy, you can call me whatever, will be at 7,000 points in the mid-near future. It's highly probable because of the inelasticity of the market. So let's start with the explanation of this inelastic market hypothesis. We are going to discuss the framework and then also the implications. We're going to discuss the basics, the fundamentals of this thesis, the results, the research, and then how that trickles down onto investing, what to follow, follow the flows, and then also finish why the market can double to 7,000 points. I have looked at this paper, it's a hundred pages of academic work. If you feel that my synthesizing it and bringing it more to a practical point of view for just investors adds value to you, please click that like button and consider subscribing. Now there are four reasons why the markets are inelastic. Institutional funds, investors are constrained, they have fixed rules what they can do, what they can't do. For example, pension funds have a fixed asset equity allocation, so let's say 70%, and that's over time, that doesn't move a lot, so it's not like they can do crazy things. Secondly, hedge funds, you expect hedge funds to impact the market, to be on the other side, to hedge, to prevent the market from going up, up and up, but that's what hedge funds should do, but they are only 5% of the market. Secondly, hedge funds, when they don't do good, people withdraw money and go with the things that are doing well. So again, when the hedge fund should do well, they have lack of funds to do so. They don't have enough funds, 5% against 95% to go short 
and really balance the market. So hedge funds also are not enough to make the market elastic. Thirdly, if you look at risk and how it moves across investment sectors from stocks to bonds to other assets, and perhaps this is why Ray Dalio is great because he dares to move across and balance, but usually when something is in equities, they stay in equities and just a minimal, minimal percentage of the market moves across net sectors. I mean, I think it's 1.5%. So it's really, really nothing. And this means that equities stick to equities, bonds stick to bonds, and there is no elasticity across sectors, thus no elasticity in markets. Also, markets are efficient, but on a specific situation. If there is an arbitrage opportunity, if there is a takeover, etc., etc., they will price in things. But over the long term and across a macro perspective, mar- markets are not really efficient. These is, are the four fundamentals of the inelastic market hypothesis. And then, speaking more on what they found, they found that flows flows impact the market most and if you look at a specific shock to the market a crash of 2000 and 2002 who is the culprit of that crash well households so households have had negative flows they withdraw just 0.5 percent of the market and that hit the market extremely 50 percent decline And second, repurchases dried up, no more buybacks, but households and net repurchases is what made the market crash 50%. But just a small retreat of funds, of flows, made a huge impact on the market because the market is not elastic. Further, if we look at 2007 and 2009, same story, households, withdrawing money, negative flows, and state and local pension funds, foreign sector, CTFs, all stable or continuing to do what their job is. Repurchases by firms also negative later, especially as many companies issued stocks, but households, households were the key and remain the key. Others are pretty irrelevant or just keep doing what they are doing. So don't attack pension funds for crashes. We, individual investors, are the culprits. Here you see the drawdowns and how those, so just a drawdown of 0.4% of the market, 50% market down, 50% market down. Okay, 0.2% of the market by end of Q1 and the market was down 34% in the last crash. These are really amazing numbers how small changes in flow have huge impacts on the market. This is very interesting and a great find by these guys. The share of return variance, of course, the biggest share is with households, then mutual funds, then foreign sectors impact and then everybody else. But we retail investors, we households have the biggest impact on the stock market. And you can also see we have lived through the biggest bull market in history. And you can see how the flows of households really over the last 10 years went up, up, up and up and pushed. And in the 1990s also up, 1980s up, 1970s down when it was the bad period for stocks. So high household flows have the most significant impact of the market. The professors tell us and find that 30% of stock market fluctuations can be explained by flows. Not fundamentals, not this, just flows of funds and how those funds impact the market. So the conclusion for the theory is that flows matter most and that has a big impact on markets, but not just on markets. Keep in mind that this is the whole macroeconomic perspective, the S&P 500, and that's not just it. What is the impact of gold? 
on individual stocks, I don't know, Tesla, NEO that has been exploding, a small, small micro cap that we have discussed, very stock, where with just a few millions, what's the elasticity there? So there's plenty of more research to be done. And if they keep doing it, they're on a great path to being the next Eugene Fama with the inelastic market hypothesis. But we have to understand as investors, what is the elasticity of the market we are investing in? Emerging markets, frontier markets are very shallow. When there's a crash, there's a big crash. When just small funds come in, then there is huge upside. Also, what are the repercussions of this? You have to see, okay, what drives the reverse? We have seen the crashes. So yes, what pushes markets up, but also down and just small changes in flows, negative or positive, have huge impacts on markets. Then on buybacks, as companies withdraw or do more buybacks to those changes in flow, that has huge impact on the market capitalization. So this has to be implemented in a model of calculating buyback efficiency for companies. That's something also that might come. Don't worry, I'm not interested in going back into academics and work with this, no matter how exciting it is. Monetary policy, we'll discuss later in how the S&P 500 can double the impacts of monetary policy and how this framework can help governments decide on how much are they going to work on that monetary policy and then also for the volatility watch what households are doing so when it comes to investing what should we do should we just follow our crazy ant that's on antidepressives already in the bull market what will she be doing in a bear market she will go crazy sell everything should we just follow that and invest According to that, just follow the flows into crazy tech stocks with huge uh, losses. Or what should we do? Well, the market says clearly you if you can predict this, and they are not predicting, they are just explaining, which is very, very important to understand. So they are explaining the market, not predicting when this will happen. This is very important to understand, but I have three investing conclusions that are key here. The markets will remain volatile given how the market is impacted by small changes in flow. The markets will remain volatile. The changes in flow depend on the psychology on the market participants. Your and my end in investing in the market is and will remain crazy when it comes to her money. So the market will remain crazy, which means there is always the opportunity on volatility and patience for those that are willing to wait. How long we'll have to wait? Well, depends on where we are lo looking. There are many, many markets. This is probably the least inelastic market, the S&P 500. There are many other markets that are even more inelastic, which gives us value investors great opportunities. And speaking of this and what drives the market, let's go to my PhD, a real value risk estimation model for an emerging market. And uh, I looked at risk and looked at how this can be combined. And my findings were that over different periods, quarter, two quarters, a year, two years, three years, fundamentals explain more and more of the market. So yes, flows have a huge impact on markets, but when you go beyond the flows, what drives the flows over the longer and longer term, the more, longer you look at, the more impact will fundamentals have on those flows. Of course, over cycles, but at the end, fundamentals prevail. And that's also in line with War what Warren Buffett says, stock market investment returns will be perfectly correlated to business returns in the long term. We don't know how long is that long term, but as investors, we have some certainty that we'll do well in the long term. Now, how can the markets double? If you're saying, Sven, fundamentals, fundamentals, but then you say also that markets could even double. Yes, markets can double in the short to medium term, so not driven over the long term. Even if the professor says that the change, the impact of flows 
are permanent for the market, that's because depending on how they look at that, depending then as investors, we are not looking just at the market, but also at individual stocks, etc. However, let's go into how the S&P 500 can double. The current market capitalization of the S&P 500 is 27 trillion for October, okay? If we look at the market capitalization of the US bond market is 42 trillion. Developed markets excluding US is 46 trillion, which means that bonds can have a bigger impact there too because the market there is much smaller and emerging markets also too. But let's stick to the US. If we remove 1 trillion of bonds and move them to stocks, Efficient market hypothesis, we remove from bonds to stocks, nothing should happen. But according to the inelastic market hypothesis, 1 trillion from bonds should push the S&P 500 5 trillion up to, from 27 to 32 trillion dollars. Of course, 5.4 trillion is what the Fed printed or will print. So that would mean 27 trillion up. That would mean the S&P 500 could be at 54 trillion whenever the Fed prints the money and somebody decides to put 5 trillion from these bonds that yield zero. You don't get anything from bonds and a risk is high, returns are low, decides them to decides to put them into the S&P 500 because of the market's inelasticity, yes, the market can go to 5,000, 7,000 point very, very quickly. So don't be surprised when you see stocks going higher, higher and higher. This is the market. This is the inelasticity of it. These are the flows with the Fed printing money, with the household, households looking at zero interest rates in the bank, just a little bit small changes in flow have this impact. When will the market crash? Nobody knows when households start selling in panic. Will they? When will they? Again, nobody knows. All we investors can do is stick to the fundamentals, buy fundamentals, and that's the only thing that will work definitely, surely, over the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. That's what I do. If you like this, please click like. You can check whatever I do on my website. There's also my book, Modern Value Investing. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next video.